This lesson is on optimization of functions of a single variable, and you'll see that some of this mirrors what's in the textbook, um, and, and some of it does not. And I actually want to start out talking about something that's not really so much emphasized in the textbook, and that is optimization as what's known as a gradient climbing procedure. And for now, um, you know, you've learned a little bit about the gradient. Um, you can think of gradient for a 1D function as just being a synonym for the derivative, okay? So for now, think of this as just meaning derivative. And I've given you a function, and we'd like to find the maximum without knowledge of the function values. And you can ask why this is. I mean, if you knew the function, it should be easy to just make a graph and pick out the highest point. Um, and that is true for a function of a single variable, but it's not true if your function depends on 30 variables, which plenty of functions in real life do. Right? How do you even plot that function? You can't. Um, so you, you don't have this tool to fall back on of just easily kind of looking at a formula, looking at a, uh, looking at a graph and picking out the highest point. So you have to have some other way to find the maximum. And it's the way we're going we're gonna to proceed here. Okay? So we're going to start out just by making a guess of where the maximum of this function is. Um, and my guess is that the location of the maximum is here, like at, at point number one. Um, and this happens to, to be the point x equals minus point 8. And we can ask, what's the value of the derivative here, right? Suppose that we knew the value of the derivative, like we knew that the tangent line has this slope. That means that the function is increasing at this point. So if we want to find the maximum, we should move a little bit in the function, in the direction that the function increases. In other words, move a little bit to the right. So then I can choose to um, make a second guess. Maybe my second guess is here, okay? This is at x equals minus 0.2, all right? Um, and you can ask about the derivative of the function. If you had some way of knowing that, um, then you would find that the derivative is positive, meaning the function's increasing, meaning that to reach higher ground, you should again move to the right. Okay, so let's, let's do that again. You take another step. And this time I stepped over here to point number three, um, this is x equals 0.25. Um, and here, if you have some way of knowing the derivative of the function, um, you find that the slope here, the derivative, is negative. That means that the function is decreasing, right? If you move to the right, the function decreases. So if you want to go to higher ground, you should go to the left, okay? So we take one more step, um, and we end up at 0.4. Well, we calculate the derivative here at this point number four. The derivative turns out to be negative once more. If you want a maximum, you should go to the left. Um, and then we end up at point number five, and it, that happens to be at x equals minus 0.05, and it so happens that the derivative there is zero, and then we stop, because the function's not increasing or decreasing in either direction. And then we, we decide that we have indeed found a maximum. We haven't found the highest point on the graph by any means, um, but we have found a local maximum. Okay? And so this is called a gradient climbing procedure. It's if you have some complicated situation where you somehow didn't know or didn't have an easy picture of the function, but you could figure out in which direction it was increasing, you would just sort of climb uphill till you got to the top of a hill, and then you'd say, I found a local maximum. Okay, here, um, let's see what happens if we use a different starting guess, okay? So I'm going to start now uh, just to the left of this point at negative 1. I'm going to actually start at minus 1.05. Um, and we're going to ask, can we use um, this sort of gradient climbing procedure to find a, a maximum? And if you calculate the derivative here, it's a little, bit, uh, a little bit negative. So if you want to move to higher ground, you have to move to the left. Um, and so we can go to this point number 2 here, um, and you calculate the derivative here slope of this tangent line, turns out to be negative, so higher ground, you go to the left, and you keep moving to the left, right? And so, in fact, we'll keep on moving to the left so long as we keep following this procedure, and this is just to show you that you get, for this gradient climbing procedure, you get different results for using different starting guesses, right? So it's not that gradient climbing always finds the maximum or the same maximum. It kind of depends on where you start, but that's the best this procedure can do, is you pick a place to start, and you walk uphill until you find a hilltop. Okay, same idea works if you're instead seeking a minimum. You just have to make sure you're walking in the right direction. So if we start at this point number one, 
and we somehow knew which direction the function was decreasing in, we would say, oh, well, the derivative here is negative. We want to move downhill, so we should move to the right. We can move to the right. The derivative here turns out to be negative as well, so we should move to the right some more. Uh, here, we can calculate the derivative, um, and it turns out to be positive, so we say, oh, maybe we moved a little bit too far. The function's increasing here, but we want to find a valley, so we should actually walk back to the left a little bit. Um, and then we can stop here when we get to the point where the derivative is zero and the function's not decreasing in either direction. Okay, so we can seek a minimum that way with a very similar procedure. And so let's talk about optimization in general. Um, for hard problems in the real world, this gradient search procedure that I just described makes very good sense. And many times it might be the only thing you can do. Um, you'll get some experience in later lessons doing a gradient search on functions of multiple variables. For simple 1D problems, functions of a single variable, there are some shortcuts, okay? And the shortcuts are basically to check for hills or valleys by finding places um, that are known as critical points, which are places where the derivative is equal to zero, okay? And then there are tests that we'll perform, and I'll show you those tests in a moment, to decide whether the point you've found is indeed a maximum or a minimum. Um, if we're interested in finding all the local and global maxes and mins, we should actually also check the endpoints of our function if it's only defined on a finite interval. So I'm going to display this procedure, check critical points and check endpoints, with a couple of examples. The first example will just be kind of an abstract one. The second one is more like a word problem. Um, here's the uh, abstract problem. It's from the textbook. We're supposed to classify the critical points and find the global max and min of this function here um, on this particular interval, x between minus 5 and 4. So critical points uh, means basically hilltops or uh, bottoms of valleys. So we're going to calculate the derivative of that function. So f prime uh, is equal to uh, 3x squared minus 6x minus 9. That's using rules for power functions. Um, and it turns out that that can conveniently be factored, so that will be helpful to us in a minute. And we're also going to want to have the second derivative on hand, so I'm going to take this first derivative, differentiate it once to get 6x minus 6. So we have a first derivative and a second derivative. Well, the critical points are the points where the first derivative is 0. And from this factored form here, it's easy to see um, that those are where x equals negative 1 and where x equals 3. Those are the critical points. And so what I actually like to do um, is to kind of go ahead and draw a little bit of a number line where I put those critical points on the number line. So on the number line, we're going to measure x. And we have x at negative 1 and x at 3. Um, and then I'm going to note something about the first derivative um, on those, at those points or around those points. So if we ask about f prime of x, well, we already know that at those two points, the first derivative is 0, because um, that's how we found them to begin with. But let's ask about what happens just to the left and just to the right. So if x is less than negative 1, um, then this first factor here will be negative, and this second factor here will be negative, and negative times a negative is a positive, so the first derivative will be positive, so I'm going to put a plus sign here. Okay. If x is between negative 1 and 3, say if it's 0, for instance, just to pick a test point, this first factor will be positive, the second factor will be negative. Positive times a negative is a negative, so the first derivative is negative. And out here, you can go through the same procedure. It turns out it's positive again. Okay? And the reason this is helpful to us is it tells us that since the first derivative is positive out here, the function increases and then it decreases out here. So this is the picture you should imagine. I'll draw it up in the corner. You have to imagine increasing and then decreasing. Okay. So that tells you that that point where it changes from increasing to decreasing, this point x equals negative 1, that point needs to be a local max. Okay. Similarly here, we have increasing and then it turns around we have decreasing, rather, and it turns around and it becomes increasing. So that's decreasing, and then things turn around and increase. So the turnaround point is here. That's a local min. Okay. This procedure we've just performed, that's known as the first derivative test. You look at whether 
first derivative changes from plus to minus or minus to plus to determine whether the point is a local max or a local min. You can get the same answer another way, and that's by using the second derivative. And to remind you, the second derivative tells you concavity. So we can calculate the second derivative at the point uh, negative 1. And let's put this down here at the bottom of the number line, f double prime of x. Um, at negative 1, the second derivative is 6 times negative 1 minus 6. That's negative 12. So the second derivative here is negative. Well, if you have a critical point and the second derivative is negative, that means things look concave down there. Concave down means looks like an upside down bowl. So right away, from knowing that it looks like an upside down bowl, you also know that it has to be a local max. It's another way of getting the same information. Similarly, out here at the critical point x equals 3, the second derivative is 6 times 3 minus 6, that's 12. That's a positive number, so the function there has to be concave up. It has to look like a bowl sitting the usual way. Okay, so that's how, another way to deduce that this critical point has to be a local min. Okay, um, the next thing we're going to do is to um, check the function values. So uh, we're going to check the endpoints of negative 5 and 4, and we just plug straight into the function f of x to find the function values there. We're going to find negative 1, um, which is one of our critical points. We're going to plug it in uh, and find that it has a function value of 20. We're going to check that this critical point has a function value of negative 12. And now we just have to look at the values to find the global max min, which is the greatest value, the biggest number. Well, it's this one. So this is the global max. The global max occurs at negative 1, which happened to be one of our critical points. Now we look at the smallest, or the most, uh, the number furthest to the left on the number line, and that's negative 140, right? That's the smallest number, the most negative number. That's the global min, and that turns out to occur at one of our endpoints. So again, the big picture of this problem, we found some critical points, um, and we could use some first uh, or second derivative tests to determine whether those were hills or valleys. And then, to find the global max min, what we do is we check the function value at the critical points and the endpoints, and we just pick off the biggest number and the smallest number. Let's do one more example. Um, this is an example from biology. Uh, this is about an organism, and the organism has to forage for food. And so, we're asking about the amount of energy it expends um, when it spends f hours per day foraging for food. And since you can't spend negative hours per day, uh, f has to be greater than or equal to zero. And we would like to find the foraging time that minimizes energy expenditure. So that's the optimization problem, minimize energy expenditure, if that expenditure is given by this formula. And right from the start, it's helpful to just make a little graph of what this looks like. And it turns out to look, if you plot that function, something like this. And obviously, for large values of time spent foraging, um, it, it makes sense that energy expenditure is high. You move around a lot to look for food. Moving around uses energy. Turns out that also at short times, it uses up a lot of energy. And that's because if you are moving around only for a short time uh, to, to do your foraging, um, then you have to have excellent territory. Like really, uh, like if you're uh, you know, some kind of squirrel, you have to have a field that has a whole lot of nuts in it um, to make sure you get enough food if you're only foraging for an hour a day. The problem is that that small, uh, that area that has so much good food in it, a bunch of other squir squirrels are going to want it too, and you have to defend the territory from them, right? You have to defend, uh, you have to stop them from getting the food you want, and fighting them off takes energy too. So there's kind of a trade-off between those two things. And we're asking kind of about what happens in the middle. When's the foraging time that minimizes energy expenditure? So, you know, there's lots of ways to solve this problem. A perfectly fine way is to take this function, make a very detailed graph of it in R, and zoom in until you find the minimum. Um, you could also solve this as a gradient descent kind of gradient climbing or descent problem like we discussed earlier in the screencast. But here we're going to do the shortcuts for 1D functions. Um, and so we're going to calculate a first derivative, and here the trick to remember is that 1.7 over f squared is the same as 1.7 f to the minus 2, right? So if you differentiate this function, you get 0.25 minus 3.4 over f cubed. We can get the second derivative, too, if we want to do the second derivative test in a moment. That's 10.2 over f to the fourth.
we can ask about critical points. Um, and there will be critical points where the first derivative is 0. So we solve the 0 0.25 minus 3.4 over f cubed equals 0. And we find this value, f is about 2.39. And then we can, uh, of course, go ahead and make the number line that we usually make. And by the way, this number line has to start at 0, because f is not allowed to be less than 0. Um, but there was only one critical point, and that critical point was at 2.39. Um, now, if we study the first derivative there, we can pick a value, um, a value that's to the left of, uh, of 2.39, and we can ask about the first derivative, so e prime to the left. Um, and what we find if we plug in uh, a value is that e prime is, in fact, negative. Okay. On the other hand, if you pick a really uh, big value for e prime, e prime turns out to be positive. You can pick test values and plug them into your calculator. Okay, so this means you have to imagine the function decreases up to the point 2.39 and then increases. Decreases and then increases. That tells us this, that this value, um, where the derivative is 0, this value has to be a local min. And this is totally consistent with the picture we drew before, where we just plotted the function. Um, we can also, of course, do the second derivative test. E double prime. If you evaluate E double prime at 2.39, we plug it into this formula here, and that gives you a positive number. Okay, So that tells you that the function is concave up. So that's another way of knowing that the picture has to look like this, and it's a local minimum. So finally, we can just test critical points and endpoints, as we always do. Um, we have one endpoint, f equals 0. Um, and it turns out that from looking at our original graph, you can't exactly evaluate the function at 0, because you can't divide by 0. But as you go towards 0, the function is going towards positive infinity. right? It's shooting straight up. Um, and so I'm going to denote that here. If we check the critical point at 2.39, we find the value of the function is 0.9. So I think we, we then have enough information to conclude. Um, the question was find the foraging time that minimizes energy expenditure. And the foraging time that minimizes it is 2.39 hours spent per day. And then the minimal energy expenditure uh, turns out to be 0 0.9 in whatever units we're measuring energy. Um, and so that's, that's the end of this problem. And I want to just ask you to reflect um, if you can explain optimization as a gradient search procedure, if you can locate critical points of a function of one variable, and if you can find the local and global extrema of a function of one variable.